I can certainly relate. It's very interesting hearing the challenges. And I, I first actually started out years ago uh, as a public health inspector, and I have 15 years of field experience sometime way back when as a health inspector, um, six years with Saskatchewan Health, and then uh, nine years with the city of Winnipeg. And I, I certainly appreciate those years and, and the experience I had. A lot of that was in core area housing, that nine years of field experience. So I can totally relate to your challenges with tenants, et cetera. And I, I, I totally remember one of the first houses I had to go into in, in uh, the North End. And this was years ago, quite a few decades. And um, it was completely remodeled. Nice job by the landlord. And eight months later, it was completely trashed. And that was, whoa, whoa. So I, I certainly understand your challenges and, and the importance of the discussions that Mark and, and Mario had this morning. It's, it's cr critical for you. Okay, let, let's go on, get on. Community bylaw enforcement uh, services, working together to improve neighborhood livability. We'll talk about that in, in a minute or two. Uh, community bylaw enforcement services was established actually in 2008 based on specific recommendations by the Red Tape Commission. So the idea there was to provide a single point of access to the community when dealing with a range of bylaw enforcement services activities. Uh, consistency of uh, service delivery and enforcement, a uniform and visible presence in the community. So I have about 30 bylaw enforcement officers during the summer, 20-ish, 22-ish right now, they are in uniform. Um, better utilize resources, eliminate duplication of services, and increase accountability for a more timely and effective reporting process. So. Our core services are property standards oriented and through a combination of education, collaboration and enforcement activity, CBS provides uh, services related to neighborhood property standards. So yard maintenance, garbage is a big one for us right now, for all of us here. Uh, vegetation control, tall grass for example, derelict vehicles, uh, building exteriors and accessory structures and dwelling interiors. The dwelling interior piece is mainly in a tenant situation. Sometimes we will go into an owner-occupied situation, hoarding, for example, uh, basement occupancy sometimes, which Greg might talk about a little bit further on. Um, the overall intent of this, you guys, like we have two major bylaws, the Neighborhood Livability bylaw, bylaw and the Vacant Buildings Bylaw. They're both online, okay? Uh, council approved in 08, and, and 10. The intent of the neighborhood livability bylaw and the intent of these services here is all about individual neighborhood well-being, it's about sustainable communities, it's about healthy living, it's about safety, uh, and it's a, about also depreciation or appreciation of property value. All those intents are established in the neighborhood livability bylaw. In terms of our approach, like I said, we're yard maintenance, building inspectors, or building interiors probably, properties and uh, exteriors, interiors. Um, the overall goal is compliance. We work collaboratively. Uh, most property owners, most landlords are responsible, and that's great. The vast majority are responsible and, and provide good premises, good living conditions. However, some are not responsible. And that's where we will get involved. Um, and for the betterment of the community, um, we don't want dilapidated uh, neighborhood blight-oriented stuff. You know, if you've got a good property and you've got this dilapidated vacant building or this dilapidated horrible yard beside you, it can really have an impact on neighborhood well-being. So our approach is very outreach, civic engagement, um, collaboration, awareness first and foremost to get compliance of bylaws, and that is our approach. Um, having said that, uh, when we have to, you know, we do have an enforcement piece too where we will issue common offense notices or tickets, and primarily where that kind of stuff starts happening, if you get repeat, 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 or if we do issue an order and we just don't get the collaboration within a reasonable time frame. And, and these bylaws have balance to them. There are standards in there, uh, but there's balance too. 
like with our vacant building bylaw, for example. It has a lot of teeth. We had to do that. We have a nine-point strategy. It was passed by council in 2010 because we had a huge problem in the city. Good news is we've now reduced it from 577 to 371 vacant buildings within three years. That's a 32% drop. A lot of that has been done through collaboration and in vacant buildings we've had to do enforcement as well. But the approach is this. We want people, like if you're interested in buying a vacant building, know the program before you get in it. We have information. I gave you a vacant buildings pro, uh, by, uh, brochure here earlier. We will work with you because we want good, we want economic development too. We want people to take over these vacant buildings and do something with them. So if you're one of those and you will work collaboratively with you, you will not be subject to $1,000 inspection fees. You will not be su subject to huge boarded building fees. You will not be subject to fines. And that's our approach. And we'll work with you as long as we see reasonable progress in a reasonable time frame. We want people. We want good property owners. We want good developers. Okay, uh, service delivery investigations. Um, we do both proactive and complaint driven work. So for example, since 2010, our 311 service requests have increased, I think it was 12,000-ish, up to 15,000 complaints. So we have one of the highest complaint per BEO officers in the country. There's municipal bylaw enforcement agencies in every city, by the way, so we compare pair notes. We have also gone proactive big time this year in particular, and in particular in the North End, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Our officers serve the residents of Winnipeg on a day-to-day -day basis, work together with communities, work closely with other uh, agencies like Greg. Uh, I've talked briefly about the neighborhood livability bylaw. That's a consolidation of 17 bylaws into one. That was 2008. I've talked briefly about the vacant buildings bylaw. The city of Winnipeg statutes like zoning, building codes, streets codes, fire codes, that's not community bylaw enforcement services. Those are handled by others. So we are mainly post-construction um, maintenance where building inspectors do construction and have a different level of expertise. Okay, some of the issues in the neighborhood livability bylaw. Properties must be kept free of garbage. Uh, no accumulations on garbage. This is a huge issue, you guys, and we have to work collaboratively to fix this. And we're starting to turn it around, and it relates to arson. So what, what has been happening out there, like in neighborhoods, especially like William White, Dufferin, St. John's, uh, Centennial, Point Douglas, um, Spence, Daniel Mack. Bulky waste is left out uh, and for extended periods of time. I guarantee you, if it's out there for more than one day, it's going to grow, you're going to attract legal dumpers, and someone's going to light it up. And then we get huge problems, right? So the city actually is looking at that closely. Uh, council did pass some legislation or, or a, a program, I should say, Earlier this year, where pickups were increased, it, it's being revisited. Actually, the Winnipeg Police Service arson folks are putting a strategy together. We're part of that. We're all part of that. And a, a lot of the problems, there's many different arson scenarios, but if we're leaving our bulky waste out too long, you know, like I say, it grows. It attracts illegal dumping, which is another huge issue that we're trying to solve in, the, in Winnipeg. And then the arsonist comes and light it up, and if it's by a side of garage, it gets bigger, and all of a sudden houses start burning. So we've got some issues, and working together, uh, we need to get awareness out. So if you've got bulky waste, phone 311. It's five bucks an item. If it qualifies, all the information is there. Uh, put it out before 7 a.m. of the garbage pickup day. Um, a lot of times, and, and you know what, I, I relate to the tenant thing again, you know, um, here's one of the issues, and, and get your heads around this one, um, when tenants move, right, something happens. So if you know your tenants are moving, you know, watch it. Sometimes they just disappear like that, and you know, what I'm trying to say is have a, a maintenance, and, and when it's moving time, that's when we see the bulk of this, of bulk waste happening. So be aware of that. Sometimes you got to take it to the landfill to Brady yourself, um, or if the item's bulky waste, 
uh, are eligible, it's five dollars an uh, item. Make arrangements through three one one, and it's on your pickup day that that'll happen. So if gar like I I know we've had numerous situations where um, garbage has been out for more than one day, and I you know I think this is the third time I've said it. I'll stop repeating, but you know it'll grow because there's illegal dumpers out there. There's people that are negligent. Um, and then it, it can be a more of a serious problem. So just a word of uh, advice there, you know, if it's your tenants are moving, watch it, you know, because um, we can get further problems. Um, interior conditions, basic standards of living, hoarding, we deal with stuff like that. Um, maintenance of floors, walls, ceiling, furnitures and fixtures, we deal with that. Maintenance of plumbing, basic utilities, water, and heat, um, and I want to talk a little bit about heat because recently something has come from, out from Council. Uh, not too long ago, Council asked the Public Service to look at our, our heating bylaw with respect to set fines. Overall, umbrella statement, the vast majority of property owners, and I'm sure everyone here, are responsible. And that's not what this is tar or who this is targeting. This is targeting situations, and I'll give you an example, um, sometimes, and not common, we get 300 lack of heat complaints per year out of our 15,000. I think there's over 100,000 rental units in the city. Is that right? Uh, illegal and legally, legally, yes. Okay. So, you know, 300 versus, you know, 100 units. I don't know how many properties that is, but it kind of gives you the perspective. It's not a huge problem, right? Um, but sometimes we get extremes, and believe me, uh, we all have stories. John's been in the field. I've been in the field. You know, um, we'll go into a, a suite, and person opens the door. They're in a muscle pe muscle shirt for Pete's sake, and they're complaining about lack of heat. We see that. We get that. You know, and, and we will conduct investigations. Um, but the rules are this: 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 21 through the day, through the night, uh, 65, which is 18 degrees Celsius. Um, that has been in existence for decades. So that is staying the same. That's what you're responsible for. What has changed is this notion of set fines. And this is an overall bylaw thing that's happening national. In British Columbia, a lot of the municipalities have initiated this. So basically, if we go in there and we find that the landlord has not taken reasonable steps, then we may issue a common offense notice or a ticket. So last year in heat, we issued six. So that gives you a perspective of 300 investigations. So most of the time we go there, the landlord, the property owner, is taking reasonable measures to correct the problem. And that's what we're looking for. Having said that, we do get the extremes where, and we just went through this recently, and it's Friday, of course, and we're running around after hours on Friday. Um, tenants, more than one, tried to call the property owner, not answering the phone, they're cold. You know, that's where we get a little excited, especially if it's after hours and we got to deal with it. Because you know what happens if we don't deal with it? We all look horrible. And where does it end up? Media. And we all look bad. They want to slam the city. They want to slam the landlord, the poor tenant. Right? Gone through that. Um, so that's where we get a little, or we get concerned. So again, you know, on, a, on an extreme, um, we ha this happens. Um, landlord is out of town and there's no one for the tenant to contact and the tenant's cold. That's where we issue tickets, you guys. All right? It, it's that gross neglect you were talking about. So, and again, our, our approach is collaborative, reasonable and fair, but where we have to, then the enforcement comes in and we will issue common offense notices and that means you, you have to go to court, to a hearing, make a plea, and guilty or not guilty, not guilty, you go to trial. Now, what this new legislation is, is set fines. So if you are issued a, a set fine, and, and they're all there on the slides, they, they differ for individual and corporate, you have an option. Um, you can do a prepayment, you don't have to go to court, and you prepay the fine, you're done. Or you can go to court and challenge it if you think it's not right and have a trial, a hearing, and then a judge will make the decision. 
So that's what this is about, and, and it's set fines. So currently, under the City of Winnipeg Charter Act, um, you have to go to court. You are required. And it's a maximum $1,000 fine for an individual or six months imprisonment. Uh, we've never done that. Um, and the judge decides what the fine is. If you're a corporation, it's 5000 under the Charter Act. That's a provincial act. So that is being changed for heat. It's now set fines right in the neighborhood livability bylaw. And if you've been convicted and there's another conviction, the fine goes up. Okay, so that's what's changed, and that's it. It's just set fines. The heat temperatures are all the same. Any questions on that? I think we've got examples. Now, quick question on that. Yeah. Um, when that came out, a lot of landlords called me and called other right. people here. And, and I guess their number one question was that if you guys get called to, let's say, an apartment building mm -hmm. where the owner pays the heat and you walk into the suite and the suite is cold, but you see that the window's open, Minus 30. And the muscle shirts. The muscle shirts, you see the windows open, then obviously that landlord is not going to get a fine. Absolutely not. Okay, so that's that's the complaint. That's the number one call I got. I'm not yep. sure about it. Well, I'll tell you, I'll, 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 just wait, I'll tell you one thing. Like you say, reasonable steps by the landlord. So if the landlord is not responding to a phone call, if the landlord is not calling a heating company, right? Because a landlord. Correct. Yeah, well, a landlord can only call a heating company. A landlord can't go with themselves and fix the furnace or whatever it might be. Okay. So as long as you see that, that's what you want to see as far as the owner trying to comply with providing heat to the unit. Correct? Yes. Now, reasonable steps. Like we, we just worked through one recently. Uh, the boiler was in the process of being repaired. The tenants were still cold. It was a number of days. Well, there's supplementary heating as well. That wasn't taking place. A baseboard heater. Now, be careful about that because you don't want to overload your system and there's fire dangers there, right? But you can do that as long as you do it within the confines of how that's manufactured, that piece of equipment. So supplementary heating uh, fixtures are, are fine as long as it's not a fire hazard. You have to really watch that, right? Because if you overload a system that can be dangerous or if these, the tenants really, you gotta watch your tenants. They don't want to put these simple baseboard heaters or you know, supplementary heaters, you know, near a curtain or whatever. So it's all about reasonable progress, reasonable steps. But the fact is, you know, if, if you're, you've got a boiler problem and it's really cold there, you've got to do something about it. And, and temporarily, you maybe have to put them in a different unit somewhere, right? Or a hotel if you don't have others. Yeah? You know, we respond to these, we prioritize these complaints within 24 hours, but most of the time when they get to us, tenants, like the last one we were just dealing with recently, for three days they were trying to get a hold of a landlord. So I, I can't really put a specific, but you know, within 24 hours, you know, as long as you're accessible. And, and believe it or not, you guys, we run into, and it's only one or two or three a year where the property owner is not accessible and does not take any action. That's where we'll get assertive, for the right reasons. You know, if people are suffering, especially if there's babies, stuff like that, and it makes us all look bad, right? Because it will go media. And we all look bad. The landlords look bad, the city looks bad, it looks like we're doing nothing, that kind of stuff. I'll add to that as well. It's kind of the way the question was asked. It, as an officer, we go in and we investigate. It's not as simple as we enter in with a, and take measurements and say, oh, I'm going to write a ticket. We do the best we can to determine what's the reasoning behind it. And obviously, uh, other factors will kind of push the button or push the agenda a little bit further when we're in like minus 35 weather and the furnace is off or not working. So there's a difference between not working and, and the switch hasn't just been flipped yet. So as Peter alluded to, 300 something complaints, six tickets. We that's a pure example of w how well we work with the landlord tenant situations uh, in, in terms of getting rectific uh, getting it rem remedied right getting and, and that's the ultimate goal getting it, the result to get the result so uh, it, it's it goes both ways if I've come across situations where 
I, I can tell the windows have been open. It's colder near the windows, or the furnace hasn't turned on, and I've been in the building for half an hour already with cold temperatures. The thermostat should have kicked in. If we feel that the tenant is manipulating the situation, we might not make the call at that time. We'll be fair and reasonable. We'll say turn on a switch, and I'll come back tomorrow, so on and so forth. The rules are set. The set fines are set. But there is still a process that we go through to ensure a fair situation is assessed and that, you know, everyone is given a chance right. to remedy. I appreciate that answer because uh, as a property manager, my, my question is, um, you know, is the city of Winnipeg now so trigger happy, right? Boom, 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 just to get, get, get like compliance will look good. And no, it's not really like that. <laughs> Mark, if I can call you and say, hey, you know, this building has no heat and you say yes, I'll get somebody there in an hour. I'll say I'll be there in two hours, and if the heat's on, file is closed, right? So, I mean, sometimes it can be as simple as that. Communication between you and me, or our officers and, and the landlords, but ultimately it's communication between the landlord and the tenant, and that's where we find difficulties, is when the tenants are frustrated. I keep calling, I keep calling, I keep calling, I keep calling, and no one's calling me back. Again, grain of salt. We know that that may or may not be true. Our goal is turn the heat on. You know, overall, oh, go ahead. Uh, many people are hired as a service provider for the heat and electric. So if something goes wrong at two in the night, your furnace stops working. Either it's a landlord or it's a tenant. <coughs> we are supposed to call many people hired for it. Or we call a, a furnace guy. Like, can we call up a hydro for that? As far as I know, because the hydro guy, they have a <coughs> for our people to come and check on the problem. They won't repair your furnace, they won't change the filters, but they would come and see what the problem is. Will that be a good work to do, or? I, you know, that's, an, I think you, you, two things are happening here that you need both. You know, I, I think in my own experiences, you know, in my own home, uh, we just had our furnace replaced. You, you need to have your furnace person and the necessary approvals depending what's done. That could be hydro or it could be actually uh, the labor guys, labor inspectors, the boiler inspectors if you have a boiler, right? Yeah. If, if I can also just add one more thing. From a business uh, point of view, if we're at minus 30 outside and the furnace is not on, you know that within six to, to eight hours the pipes are going to start freezing. Uh, it's in your best interest. Yeah, to definitely. Great point. As, as quickly as possible. The when at what uh, time of the day you are you are you to have the things up and running? There's, the bylaw does not speak to any time of the year. So somebody could phone in at ten o'clock and say, "Hey, it's kind of cold out." You know what? That's interesting. Sounds a plus. Yeah. Yeah. It, the month of September, especially this year, is an interesting month. We actually. We, we look at it and we kind of chuckle. We actually, the last couple of years, we had one complaint in August, one in July, the year before, and, you know, okay, even September. And, you know, we, we get that, but complaints can start coming in to us, you know, like, you know, especially the elderly, right? And we find a trend there that, you know, 70 degrees, they're not, they want it warmer than that, but the bylaw says 70. So we do get those complaints in September, and we know when it's going from, you know, five degrees Celsius at night to 25 yeah. in the afternoon. We take that into consideration, you guys, yeah. Someone okay? Someone said to me that it was sometime in uh, October that everything must be up and running. But well, there's no, there's no time. Was this ever the case? Pardon me? Was this ever the case? <coughs> was a set date ever no. the case? No, no, okay. no, that bylaws. I've heard that bantied about for years, yeah. And it's not, you know, before the neighborhood livability bylaw was passed in 08, the heating standards bylaw was the existing one. And I know as a health inspector back in the 80s and the 90s, um, it was basically the same. And there was no mention of time. So for 30 years almost, is yeah, no. <laughs> so if it gets cold in September, you know, and we had a nice warm September, but if it gets cold in September, you know, below freezing abnormally, you're required to provide the heat. You guys have been very nice, and I want to point out to you that I, my office entrance is in front. I had a tenant at the back 
she was bipolar. And you, some of you might remember her, made hundred and something calls to the fire department and ambulance service. Because she, they, she called, the fire department came and broke the window. Okay. And as such, she was saying that I'm cold, but I was hot. And then I was charged, my wife was charged. She's the boss, she was charged. But we won. Reason is that the bylaw officer, she was gone, <laughs> you know, and I wouldn't take that. And okay. so the judge asked the question, did you check the other units? No, I didn't. But this woman had been complaining, it was A, B, C, D, every hour. Sometime the fire department, the internet, made a mistake. Now, <clears throat> for me, that was a harassment to my right. Mm -hmm. You don't just come there because you're asked to do a job that you could be talking to us in any of. I she didn't need to my right. I was in the office to get to hell off. Get to hell off. Told me that these are her approach. And uh, what I'm asking you guys mm -hmm. that you need to approach people in a proper way, some do, some don't, and don't always think that landlords have money. Some landlords are broke, and you do this now, you do this in this office, sit up and talk, and you'll get results. Agreed 100% with that comment. Um, I've been leading this division for three and a half years now, and, and John with me, and our approach, our leadership style, and we get that, is, um, you have to be professional, right? And we, when we have a complaint and there's rights of entries and stuff like that, it's all being reviewed. Um, we conduct an investigation and we go after the facts and our approach is to be professional. And our staff are highly trained with that, with respectful workplace, with customer service strategies. Over the last two years now, quality control, including customer service and how we come across um, has been a priority to train, to be professional. Okay? I think we're out of time. Okay. Um, you know, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, there's some stats at the back, just some performance stuff, uh, recent of what we've done. I, again, maybe to finish, and that's a good feedback, thank you. Um, Again, we work collaboratively. We conduct investigations, high level. The compliance rate with things like neighborhood livability via law is around 95%. So again, the vast majority of property owners are responsible. We have challenges. Uh, when we have to, then we would go to a common offense notice and typically, which is a court summons, that would be if there's lots of repeat behavior. And, and secondly, if there's failure to comply with an order in a reasonable time frame. But the vast majority of the work gets done. We get compliance through collaboration. And thank you for those comments about approach. And that is critical to maintain professionalism. Thank you very much. Thank you.